Well, welcome back one final time to our sermon series, Some Assembly Required. You know, it just might be the most misused, misquoted, misunderstood thing that God ever said. And most of you probably smiled when you heard it. I bet you were there in a a big, beautiful church on a beautiful summer day. You turned your head like everyone else as the blushing bride walked in in her beautiful gown. You watched the the groom, the husband-to-be, fight back tears in that moment. There was the, the reading, the song, the unity candle. She passes the bouquet. They join hands, look into each other's eyes. And that's when the guy up front, the minister, opened the book and he butchered the Bible. And you smiled when he did it. Because it was probably about the time in the service when he opened the scriptures and he read this section from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He said, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. But rejoices with the truth. It always protects. Always trusts. Always hopes. Always perseveres. Love never fails. Have you heard that scripture before? It's the classic wedding text, right? And when you heard it, you probably looked up at the couple and said, aw. And I think God looked down from heaven at the couple and he said, what? A a wedding? (laughs) I'm not exactly sure what God thinks at weddings, but I wonder if he doesn't think that. Because when, when God originally inspired these words, it had nothing to do with weddings. 2,000 years ago when the Apostle Paul wrote these words, it wasn't his best friend or his roommate from college, upcoming wedding that inspired him to write it. You know, do you know actually what the scripture is about? It comes in the Bible in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Does anyone here know what comes right before 1 Corinthians 13? 1 Corinthians 12. Thank you very much. All right, you're you're paying attention with me here today. And do you know what 1 Corinthians 12 is about? Uh, It's about people. People like you, whether you're single or you're married, you're dating or you're divorced, it's about people who come to church and they look at the people next to them and they realize, uh, you're not me. See, 1 Corinthians 13, the great section in the Bible about love is not about wedding days, it's about every day. Every day that you find yourself in a church, in a Bible study, volunteering, in a family, in a relationship, with friends, at college, with people who are not you, which is actually really good news. Because it means that that beautiful section of scripture that has inspired people for thousands of years is not just applicable on certain days of the year, but every day. It's applicable on those days when you're, uh, you're like an activator. You know, you're, you're the kind of person that says, ready, fire! <laughs> and you don't even need time to aim. And you find yourself at a staff meeting with the, the person who's deliberative and they're thinking, aim, Aim. Have we aimed yet? Let's, let's aim. We should adjust the aim. And you want to wring their neck just a little bit. It's for those kind of moments. It's for the moments when you're the kind of social butterfly that loves to work the room at work parties and family gatherings. And when you go out to eat and you start dating the person who's the wallflower, who's just checking their watch, wondering when we can go home and just be us. It's, it's for those moments. It's for the time when, when the dad of the third grade basketball team is coaching and he wants maximum potential out of these kids and he's a competitor and you're sitting in the stands and you have so much empathy and all you care about is the kid at the end of the bench and you want him to be included and loved. It doesn't matter to you what the score is, how things turned out. It's for those moments. You know, it's for the times when you meet someone who loves the rules and the policies and the procedures and you like to take things as they come. It's what happens when you're a preschool parent and you come to my wife's classroom and uh, she, she believes that September 1st is the cutoff date for a reason and that policies have been well thought out, but you're just the kind of person that thinks there are exceptions to every rule, right? And you're going to email my wife and she's going to take a deep breath and ask me to pray for her before she responds. You know, when, when people are different, when we, when we think and solve problems and communicate in different ways, that's when these words are golden. Because without all this stuff, without patience and kindness, 
without that passion not to be easily angered or keep record of wrongs, without that desire to protect one another and hope in one another and persevere with one another, everything blows up, right? I mean, churches blow up, classrooms blow up, friendships blow up, marriages blow up, relationships blow up, families blow up. But with this stuff, I mean, it glues us together in such a beautiful way. Okay, can you imagine if the members of your family lived by the scripture? Can you imagine if you came here to this church and the people that, that you met and talked to, they, they just lived and breathed these kind of descriptions? Can you imagine being at a place where, where people are not easily angered with you and, and they're patient when you don't see eye to eye and you just see that the kindness in their greeting and their expression and you mess up and you sin and they don't keep a record of your wrongs and they persevere with you even though you're a work in progress and they just don't fail you uh, even if they fail and fall into sin. And I would love, love to be part of a church like that. And I bet you would too. And really that's why the Apostle Paul inspired these words. See, 2,000 years ago, he had started this church in a big metropolitan city called Corinth. And he had pastored there for about 18 months and then Paul had moved on to a new mission. He had gotten word that the people he loved so much were not loving each other. They lacked love for each other. And so he picked up his pen and he wrote this classic section of scripture that we read at at weddings and and hopefully after today on so many other days. See, Paul knew there was a problem in that church among his friends that he needed to fix. And so he penned one of the most famous sections in the entire Bible. So as we think about love, as we think about unity, as we think about families and schools and churches and the Christian church at large, uh, let's study with fresh eyes these words that the Apostle Paul wrote. If I can direct your attention on the screen, here's how we set things up in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. He said at the end of that chapter, now you are the body of Christ and each one of you is a part of it. And God has placed in the church, first of all, apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, of helping, of guidance, and of different kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work miracles? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? If my math is right, that's seven straight questions. And Paul's looking for the same answer. Are you all the same? No. Can you all do this? No. Can you all do that? No. Does everyone have, have this role? No. This position? No. This calling? No. No, 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 Paul. And then once he has their attention, he gives them a little bit of clickbait. Like first century, I, I got to read where this goes. Because Paul ends 1 Corinthians chapter 12 with this tantalizing line. Look what he says next. He says, now eagerly desire the greater gifts. And yet I will show you the most excellent way. Paul says, oh, okay, some of you can do miracles. You can speak in tongues. You can heal people just by laying on your hands. That's great. But I'm going to tell you something better. Here, here, come here. I'm going to show you the most excellent way, the greatest gift. And when they're leaning in, like just eager to have something that no one else has, Paul backhands them with the Bible. (laughs) Paul drops this bomb right in the middle of the church and it's so convicting that I bet at most weddings that you've been to, they skip this part. First Corinthians 13, the great love chapter, do you know how it actually begins? It begins like this. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Wow. Paul says, you could have it all. Like you could speak English, and French, and Italian, and Chinese. Paul says you could even speak angel. And he says you you could know it all. Like you you could dominate Bible Jeopardy before the question was was even read. You could explain the Trinity to a three-year-old 
You could figure out logically how the, the infinite God whom the universe can contain could fit in his entirety in the one cubic foot womb of the Virgin Mary. And Paul says you could give everything. Never mind giving, giving 10% and some of your tax return. Paul says you could reverse tithe. You could live off of ramen and water and live in your mom's basement because you give so much to the poor. And then you could become the ultimate good Samaritan. You could push that person out of the way of the city bus and end your own life. Paul says you could have all of it put together. But if you don't have love, it's nothing. Paul says if you don't have love, it's nothing. You gain nothing. In fact, as a human being, you, you are nothing. <laughs> if you're taking notes in your, in your program today, that's Paul's first convicting point. He says, without love, it doesn't matter the strength, the talent, the gift, the miracle. Without love, he says, we are nothing. It's kind of like your, your skin. If you could put your pens on for a second um, and, and follow along with me. I want you to take your pulse for a second. Because if you have a pulse, thankfully I haven't killed you with the first part of the sermon, and it means that your, your heart is working. Right? Th- think of what an incredible part of your body the heart is, constantly pumping like this lifeblood throughout your body. Now, now I want you to take a deep breath in and a deep breath out. <sighs> Do you know what just happened? Like your body sucked in plant breath converted it in these little pockets in your lungs and breathed out the food that will help our planet survive. And you didn't have to think about it. It's ridiculous. All these organs that God placed inside of our body. But can you imagine, I want you to just pinch your skin for a second. Can you imagine what would happen to those organs if you didn't have this? If you didn't have skin and tissue and muscles keeping those organs here where they belong, (laughs) those organs would not be that impressive, would they? I mean, can you imagine a beating heart sitting in a sloppy pile of like Wisconsin winter residue? Or you drop your, your lung in a pile of gravel and it's covered in dirt and, and grit. I mean, these impressive organs would be nothing without this. And Paul says the same thing about love. He says, you can be impressively smart and impressively generous. You can do things that just impress the world on social media, but if face-to-face, when people meet you, if there's not love, Paul says it's not impressive. And you know that, right? Because you've met impressive people who are not loving. You grew up and some of the impressive kids at your school were not loving. You've worked with people who are shockingly intelligent, but they were not loving. And when you meet someone who's not loving, right, it's not impressive. Impressive. You can be in a relationship, you can be married to someone who is so talented at what they do, they make six figures. But if they come home and and they're not patient and they're not kind and their goal is not to to serve but to be served, there's nothing good about that relationship. You can play sports with someone who's first team everything, all state scholarship offers, but if that person treats you like second class trash, There's nothing good about playing on that team. In fact, you could come to a church and the pastor could know a a thousand more Bible passages than you do. But if if the pastor's in it for himself and not for you, if he's not there to listen and and to pray and to love, that church is nothing. You can volunteer with someone who's incredibly organized and, and, you know, they'll give 10 hours a week to the church or they sing in the band and they have incredible musical gifts, but if that person is controlling and vindictive and everyone's walking around on eggshells, it doesn't matter how much they do for the church. Paul's right, right? Without love, uh, it's it's nothing. And I think that's why no one came to church with me in high school. I ran into a high school classmate online this past week. It's been 20 years. Right, since I graduated. And I pulled out the old yearbook and I started looking at all those, all those old pictures and I saw a picture of myself. And I should tell you this, when I, when I was in high school, I was abnormally devoted to Jesus. Like when you think about high school, teenagers, college people who drift from the faith, that was not me. Right? I, I was in church every Sunday even if my family couldn't go. I read my Bible cover to cover before I graduated from public school. 
I poke fun at my wife for her list, but I, I had the same thing. I remember little boxes for each chapter that I would check as I would go through. When I delivered papers, when I cut grass, I, I, would, I would give 10% of my gross income and even more. When my boss wanted to pay me in cash, I said, I have to report this. I drove the speed limit. I never had an alcoholic drink till I was 21 and I was a virgin until my wedding night. Passionate for Jesus. You know how many people I got to come to church with me during those four years? Zero. Uh, and I think I know why. My mom stumbled across a, a paper I had written during my sophomore year for language class. And the only way I could describe it to you would be with the word disgusting. It was a paper about how America was in this like moral spiral. And all these terrible things that these terrible people were doing, it was all about these people being the problem. And, and it was so it was so disgustingly judgmental and proud and I'm one of the good ones and these people are the bad ones that I was embarrassed that my name was on the top of that paper. And I thought to myself, no wonder. Because you can know it all and you can read it all and you can give it all and you can be there every Sunday but if you don't have, if you don't have love, uh, it's nothing. So I'm going to ask you a hard question today. What, what are you justifying because you're talented? Okay, so you're the, you're the best athlete on the team. That, that's not God's question. The, the question is, how do you treat the kid on the end of the bench? So you're popular at school. Great, God doesn't care. What he, what he cares about is what you say when you come across that kid in the hallway who can't hide the dandruff on his hand-me-down sweater. So, so you're amazing at your job and you get an incredible amount done at home, but that's not God's question. The question is not what you do or how much you do, but do you do the things that make the people in your home feel, feel loved? And you can make money and you can have followers and you can have friends. God cares nothing about it. Because he says without love, uh, it's nothing. Actually, he says it is something. It's a clanging symbol. It's not just nothing. It, it's not just neutral. It, it's like your neighbor who decides to snow blow at five in the morning on a Saturday, right? It's, it, it's worse than nothing. It's negative. And that's why we so desperately need Jesus. You know, it's, it's ironic to me that we read this section of scripture on wedding days because it has to be one of the most convicting parts in all the Bible, isn't it? You can do this and be this, but if you're not this, it's... It's nothing. But that's why when I do premarital counseling, I make people put Jesus in the middle of this scripture. Have you not been patient? Have you not been kind? Do you keep a record of wrongs? Do you fall short? Do you not persevere? Okay, me too. But that's why I make people do this. We put Jesus in the middle of this and it sounds a little bit like this. And yet I will show you the most excellent one. Jesus is patient. Jesus is kind. Jesus does not envy. Jesus does not boast. Jesus is not proud. Jesus does not dishonor others. Jesus is not self-seeking. Jesus is not easily angered. Jesus keeps no record of wrongs. Jesus does not delight in evil but rejoices with the truth. Jesus always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Jesus never fails. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> I love that when when, when my spiritual life is not what I want it to be, I, I come back to these words and I put Jesus in the middle of it because he is, he's everything. <laughs> he's so patient. Like you and I mess up and he's patient. And in Greek, um, Paul's word for patience means something that takes a long time to boil, right? <laughs> Jesus is not this little cup of water and when your sin gets on the bottom of it, he's like this big old massive five gallon drum and it takes a whole lot of sin to make Jesus mad. He's so patient with us. And he's so kind. I mean, have you read the Bible before? You would think God who knows everything about us, all the lack of love, he would put the smack down. But have you read the scriptures? The way he speaks about people who follow Jesus, that you're, you're, you're his bride, his blessing, his church, his people. He's not embarrassed by you. He's not ashamed of you. He is so kind. He's not proud. 
That Jesus would go all the way to the cross, even though he's the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, his name is the one that's above every name, and yet he is the one that was crucified, and he does not dishonor others. When he could rub your face in it, he doesn't. When you come back to Jesus and say, I I messed up, I I didn't love, I, I got distracted, I forgot about the most excellent way, the most important thing, he keeps no record of wrongs. Can you imagine that there's a passage in the Old Testament that says God forgives our wickedness and he remembers our sins no more. It's like you wake up in the morning and you think, why did I, why did I do that? And why did I say that? And I know better than that. I heard that in church. And you confess it to Jesus. You know what he says? What's that? <laughs> he never fails. He always perseveres. He always protects us. And this is why we love Jesus. If you're new to church, if you're new to Christianity, if you grew up in the kind of religion that was all do this and don't do that, I have to tell you today why we love Jesus is because he is love. If he was just miracles and healing people and multiplying bread and fish, we would respect him, but we would not worship him. But he is so much more. He is the essence of love. And we run back to him. We fall at his feet when we fail to love. And Jesus, he's everything. That's really Paul's big idea to the Corinthians. What I want you to take away today from this message, that because of love, so patient, so kind, Jesus is everything. And that's what I want you to know. Because in just a few minutes, I'm going to say amen. And you're going to see those people again. And they're going to be different, right? And some of their quirks will confuse you and frustrate you. But if you're looking up to Jesus, you'll know exactly what to do. When you were so different than the Son of God, he he looked down at you and he loved. And I need us to remember that because I I have a feeling the next few weeks and the next year are going to be a lot like the last one. And even though our church is passionate about the Bible and we want to put down good roots and grow spiritual fruit, we want to center our lives around Jesus, I'm pretty sure it's going to happen again. There's going to be the tragedy that we don't see coming. There's going to be the the depression that just broadsides another follower of Jesus. There's going to be anxiety that's so deep we we think about not coming back on Sunday. There's going to be suicidal thoughts. There's going to be a marriage that's fracturing. There's going to be grief that makes us question the goodness and love of God. There are going to be brothers and sisters who think their faith is fine even though it's been weeks since they've gathered around the grace of God with the people of God. There are going to be miscarriages and couples that can't have kids. There are going to be people that we reach out to and they don't respond. There's going to be bullying, sexual harassment, abuse. It's going to happen. And when it happens, do you know what we need? We need you. We need you with your gifts. We need empathetic hearts and people who love harmony. We need strong leaders and people who can figure out problems. We need natural communicators and hand holders. We need people who work behind the scenes and people who lead us on stage to praise the goodness and the love of Jesus, the Messiah. We need you and you need me and we need each other just to love. And as we do, we'll be ready to reach out into this world because there are people that you know who have no clue about love. They live with guilt and regret, they're they're drowning in just a sea of unbelief and they don't even know what the problem is, but together, uh, we can help. Like what happened in Florida last year. Uh, Did you hear the story? This this woman brought her family to a beach and she had two sons, ages nine and 11. The kids went out to swim and suddenly they screamed because they got caught there was this underwater current that was so strong, the boys couldn't make it back and, and mom panicked and, and she did what so many of you mothers would do. She went diving out into the water and she got to them, but then she got stuck. And so other family members heard their screams and they swam out to save them and then they got stuck until nine family members were together out in the sea, helpless and drowning. A police officer happened to be on the beach that day and he, he dove into the water until he realized that he was going to get caught too and it was so bad that he went back to shore. People watched thinking that they were going to see, witness nine people lose their lives. Until one person had an idea. 
She planted her, her feet firmly on the sand and she said to someone else, grab my hand. And she did. And then a third and then a fourth into the water and then a fifth and then a sixth until there were 10 and then 20 and then 30. Some witnesses say up to 80 people held hands in water that was 15 feet deep until the 80th hand extended to that family and saved them. I'll show you a picture of what that rescue looked like. And that line of people were black and white, Hispanic and Asian, young and old, male and female, tall and short, skinny and overweight, but it didn't matter. In love, they held their feet in solid places and they linked hands and people were saved. (laughs) Which sounds to me a whole lot like the mission of God's people. Introvert, extrovert, male and female, young and old, new to the Bible and longtime Christians. If we have our feet grounded in the grace of God, the love of Jesus, and we hold hands, we can reach people. And together, the body of Christ will get bigger. New parts, new gifts, new souls saved, the people you love, the people that I love. How do we do it? With Jesus, with love, and with every part in the body of Christ. Let's pray. Dear God, not too long ago, every one of us was drowning. We were born in sin and unbelief, but you loved. You didn't let the fact that we were lost and like sheep going astray stop you. Instead, you sent one Christian and then another and they linked hands in a chain that we can't possibly count. And there was that one person, God, who explained to us what you're like and it changed our hearts and our lives forever. God, help us to be that kind of people. Help us not to be afraid of the wind and the waves, the depth of the water, because you are with your people as we hold on together in love. Through Jesus, there are people right now in this city, in our families, at our workplaces, on our teams who have no clue. They have no clue how good it is to know the God who is love. They don't know what to do with their embarrassing past and their sin and their shame, but, but we, know, we know how good Jesus is and how completely forgiving the cross is. And so God, give us a passion to go, to link hands and to be the church you've designed us to be. Protect our church family and our families from bickering, from arguments and from sin. Protect us from a lack of love and keep our eyes fixed on Jesus. God, we can only love if we remember that you first loved us and you did and you do, and you always will. And so we pray all these things as your people, as every different part in the body of Christ, join their voices, and we said, Amen.